Hi, my name is Cheyong Pak. I am a PhD candidate at University of Massachusetts Amherst, and the title of my presentation is Making Things Collectively. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how mass production and what I call collective production can cause some serious problems in Simon Epnin's view about concrete artifacts. And then I'm going to propose a solution based on Simon Epnin's own view about actions, which I'm going to call the artifactual view of action. But first, um, let me begin with this question about the ontological status of ordinary objects or concrete artifacts. And by ordinary objects or concrete artifacts, I mean spatial temporally located objects um, that are the result of human labor. Now, the question is an ordinary object different from the matter that constitutes it has been around us, I mean, philosophers for quite a long time. And some philosophers say that the answer to this question is no. An ordinary object is just the matter that constitutes it. An ordinary object is nothing more than the matter that constitutes it. But according to Simon Epnin, the right answer to this question is yes. An ordinary object is something more than its matter. Well, according to Simon Epnin, what makes an ordinary object more than its matter is the act of making. More specifically, it is the creative intention and the act of imposing that intention on matter that makes a concrete artifact more than its matter. Here, the important part is the creative intention. According to Epnin, not any kind of intention could be, <coughs> excuse me, not any kind of intention could be a creative intention. It has to be the right intention. For instance, um, one cannot create an artifact with the mere intention of creating something. According to Epnin's view, an intention to create a thing with an essence that determines spatial and temporal boundaries and degree and kind of mode of flexibility can be the genuine creative intention. So um, in other words, in order to say that you really have the genuine creative intention, you must have the essential properties or the functions of the kind of artifact that you want to create. And once you have this intention, then you can impose that intention on matter by manipulating your chosen hunk of matter to realize your intention. And then when your creative intention and your labor is combined, you have a new object. You created a new object, namely a concrete artifact. So one option of Evans' account is that it fits so well with our common sense. It just seems natural that if artifacts are different from their matter, they must be because they are created by people, whereas some hunks of matter, they are not created by people. And Evans' view captures this exact intuition so well. And moreover, his view works exceptionally well for what he calls artisanal artifacts. Artisanal artifacts are artifacts created by a single artisan or a small group of artisans and they obviously have creative intention, the right intention, and they impose that intention on matter with their own hands. But the problem is that most artifacts we see and use every day are not, be, not made by artisans. So for instance, if you look around you right now, you're going to be able to see a lot of concrete artifacts. Um, you may see your cell phone, you're going to be able to see your laptop, um, you might have some ball pens lying next to you, and you might even be able to see your neighbor's house outside your window. But you can see that none of them are created by a single artisan or even a group of artisans. Most artifacts we see and use every day are often made by people who work on some materials without the right intention in their mind, namely workers who work in factories. So in the following sections, I'm going to point out that many concrete artifacts are in fact created by two types of production namely mass production and collective production. I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between them, and I'm going to show how evidence view fails to explain how the final product of mass production and collective production become artifacts. So let me begin with probably the most familiar kind of production process, mass production. So I think that most ordinary objects we see and use every day are created by mass production, like our clothes or cell phones or our, or our laptops or paper clips. Um, in many cases, mass production involves a number of workers who are given this highly compartmentalized task in a very complicated production process. So sometimes all they need to do is to push some buttons to operate machineries, or sometimes they may actually work on some materials of the final product, but they only build a very, very small part of the final product. 
Well, I think that we all have this very rough but very clear idea of what mass production is. So I will not try to explain more about what mass production is. So we all know what mass production is because so many things around us are created by mass production process. And mass produced items, without a doubt, are concrete artifacts. But if we follow Evnin's view, then we get a very surprising result. Um, according to Evnin's view, mass produced items cannot be artifacts because workers who really work on materials of the final products do not have the right intention. For instance, if you work in an electric car factory as one of the workers on the assembly lines, your job might be this one very simple task, tightening a bolt to this particular place. And if that is your job, even though you are the one who's manipulating the material of the final product, you wouldn't know what that bolt does, let alone the functions and essential properties of electric cars. So even though the workers in factories are definitely doing the labor. They are not imposing the creative intention by doing the labor because they do not have the right intention in the first place. And since the labor without the proper creative intention cannot genuinely create an artifact, it turns out that mass produced items are not actually artifacts, which is a quite implausible consequence. And the similar problem occurs in items produced in a slightly different way. I'm going to call this particular production process collective production. Um, in a collective production, there are multiple groups of professionals and um, each group specializes in producing a particular part of the final product. And building a house would be a good example of collective production. So if you think about the, pro the whole process of building a house, um, the first step would be having an architect or a group of architects make a blueprint. And then they're going to send it over to builders who then will commission several groups of professionals to create various parts of the house. So a specific group of workers would come and do the plumbing and plumbing only. And this other professionals group of professionals would come and do the framing of the house. And then these other professionals would come and do the exterior works and exterior works only. So there is definitely some difference between mass production and collective production because in collective production, those groups that specializes in making certain parts of the final product do have the creative intention and they do impose that proper creative intention on matter with their own hands. But then the problem is that their intention is limited to creating a specific part of the final product. And since there is no one who works on matter with the intention of creating this final product, the final product itself cannot be brought into existence as an artifact. So therefore, following Evnin, a collectively produced item cannot be an artifact itself, even though its parts do exist as artifacts. For instance, if you think about a house, a house cannot be an artifact according to Evnin, but all of its parts, like its plumbing system, its frames, etc., are artifacts. And that is quite a peculiar result. So given that most concrete artifacts we see and use every day are in fact produced by mass production and collective production, these problems may pose a serious threat against Simon Evans' view about concrete artifacts. But I think that it is too soon to give up on his view about concrete artifacts. In fact, I want to suggest that we can solve the problems by using Evans' own view about action. And I'm going to call Evans' view about action the artifactual view of action. And according to the artifactual view of action, actions are just like artifacts. Um, according to this particular view, um, actions are created by an agent when the agent has a creative intention to make a particular action out of some matter. And the only difference between making an artifact and making an action is that in cases of making an action, the matter out of which you're going to create a new action is going to be your own basic bodily movement. So for instance, let's say that it gets suddenly very dark out there, so I want to turn on the light. Now, in order to do this action of turning on the light, according to the artifactual view of action, I first need to have this creative intention of making an action of turning on the light out of more basic action, namely my bodily movement of moving my fingers in certain ways. So um, now I'm going to treat my bodily movement of moving my fingers in a certain way as matter. 
And on this matter, I'm going to impose my creative intention of turning on the light. And just like an artifact is something over and above its matter, this action of turning on the light would be something over and above this basic bodily movement of moving my fingers in certain ways, just because of this creative intention. So that's the artifactual view of action, but how do we solve the problems of mass production and collective production with this? Well, what both problems seem to share is that the workers who manipulate the materials of the final product do not have the creative intention. But if you think about it, there are people involved in the whole mass production and collective production who do have the right intention. And here I'm thinking of designers, architects, engineers, or any people who design the final product and or oversee the whole production process. And um, the problem, the only problem is that those people are not in the position to impose their genuine creative intention on matter. So the problem here is that there's this gap between the creative intention and the labor, and it seems like we can solve both problems by filling in that gap. So now you may be able to see the clue as to how this artifactual view of action can solve those problems. So according to the artifactual view of action, one can make her own action out of more basic actions, right? So if an agent can also make her action out of a plurality of other agents' actions, then we can use this field to solve the problems of mass production and collective production. Because now, um, based on the artifactual view of action, we would be able to say that those people with the right intention are actually making their action of imposing that intention of matter out of other workers' actions. But here, there is an obstacle because Evnin himself does not say much about, or in fact, anything about applying his view to cases where multiple agents are involved. So I want to propose a supplemented version of the artifactual view of action. And I'm just going to call this view the new artifactual view of action. So the new artifactual view of action allows the possibility of making one's actions out of others' action. But you cannot just freely make your own action out of other people's actions. It is only when you are in this specific position in a specific given social context, which allows you to use others' actions as the matter of um, your own action that you can make your own action out of others' actions. It was quite a masterful explanation. So to put it in a simpler term, if you are given the authority to control what others do in a certain social context, then you can make your own action out of other people's actions. And here, the social context may include being in an organized group with structured set of rules that grant certain people authorities to control or order other people, but it can also include being in an unorganized groups without any structured set of norms. So for instance, let's say that you are an executive chef in a restaurant, in this fancy restaurant. And if you work in a restaurant, then you're following the structured set of rules that says that this person is going to this and this and this, this and this and this in this kitchen, this other person with this job would do this and this and this. So um, by taking this position of an executive chef with this structured set of rules, then you're going to be automatically granted the authority to control or order your subordinate chefs. So, so with that authority, you can actually make your own action of serving the perfect dinner courses to the customers out of other chefs' works, even though you're not actually doing any physical labor. But even among a group of friends, a similar thing can happen when, um, let's say that you are really great at cooking something, so your friends, um, just agree that it would be best for us if you can just design the dinner course that we are going to serve to our parents, and then we are going to follow whatever you want us to do, then um, they are granting you this authority to order or control what they do. So the important thing is not about whether you are in these organized groups or unorganized groups. The important thing is that one can make her own action out of others' actions when she is granted the authority to do so by the norms or the consensus within a group. And with this revised version of the artifactual view of action, now we can easily solve the problems of mass production and collective production. So let's first begin with mass production. So in a mass production case, it is the designers who design the final product or even the managers who oversees the whole production who truly create the final product. So how do they do that? Well, they do so by first having the creative intention and second, by making the action of imposing the creative intention of matter out of factory workers' actions. 
Now, a similar explanation is available for a collective production case. In a collective production case, it would be the designers or architects or engineers who design the final products, who truly create the final products. And they do so by first having the creative intention and second by making the action of imposing the creative intention of matter out of the actions of the members of subcommittees or subgroups that specialize in creating certain parts of the final product. So um, in this way, the designers, architects, engineers, whoever that have the right intention for the final product would be the true agent of the creation of the final product of mass production or collective production because they are the ones who have the right intention and they are the ones who are imposing the creative intention of matter. It's just that the letter is done in this indirect way. So um, it seems like now we have closed in this gap between the creative intention and the labor. But even if one does accept that the new architectural view of action solves the problems of mass production and collective production, one can still question whether this view, the new architectural view of action, is worth endorsing by itself. Well, um, I think that it is. So one additional upshot of the new architectural view is that it offers a commonsensical, plausible explanation of cases where multiple agents do things together without sharing a goal or without equally sharing responsibilities or praise or blame. So um, I want to compare the new architectural view of action with the traditional theories we have about collective action, like Bretman's works or Gilbert's works. And um, those traditional theories about collective action mostly focus on small scale collective action, sorry, on small scale cooperative activities in which a small group of people share the same goal, share the plan to achieve the same goal and communicate with each other quite often. And in such typical cases of collective action, all the agents involved are the equal agents or the equal subjects of the action of achieving their shared goal. But there are many activities that involve multiple agents that do not share the same goal, do not divide the responsibilities, praise or blame equally, but still do something together. Such activities happen quite frequently in large groups with structured set of rules, um, like large corporations. So for instance, workers scattered all around the world who work for the same company may work for, sorry, um, may work in the same project without knowing each other or knowing exactly what the project aims to do. They just do some parts of the project as they are told to do. In the end, all of their actions result in the success of the project or even the failure of the project. But um, if the project su succeeds, they did carry out the project together. Yet this does not fit the typical description of collective actions because they, are, they do not share the same goal and they do not even know each other. But um, the new architectural view can explain what is going on in cases like this. The person in charge of the project, according to the new architectural view, is the true subject of achieving or failing to achieve the final goal of the project. And people who do their parts in the project are actually the subject of fulfilling their parts and fulfilling their parts only, but it is actually the leader or whoever is in charge of the whole project that makes the action of successfully carrying out the project out of those other workers' actions. So I believe that the new architectural view can say something really interesting about those cooperative team actions where people do not exactly share the same goal together, but I also believe that the new architectural view may have some interesting consequences in cases like coercion, manipulation, enslavement, or using others as a means. Depending on the context and the intention of the agent in question, um, by using this new architectural view of action, we might be able to identify the one who coerced or manipulated others as the true agent of the action done by the coerced or the manipulated. I believe that it would be really interesting to see what the new architectural view could say about such non-cooperative actions involving multiple agents. But since, unfortunately, I do not have enough time to do this here, I'm going to leave it for my future project. So here's a quick recap of the whole presentation. A ministry of artifacts fails to explain artifacts created by mass production and collective production as artifacts. And I suggested that by revising his architectural view of action to accommodate the possibility of making one's action out of other agents' actions, he can solve the problems of mass production and collective production. And in the end, I um, mentioned that the new architectural view of action 
offers not only the solution to the problems of mass production and collective production, but some interesting ways to understand some cooperative and non-cooperative actions. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to um, put an additional page in my slide, PowerPoint slide um, that has some information about the references that I used in my presentation, along with some additional information that I wanted to include in my presentation, but didn't get to. Anyway, um, thank you all for tuning in and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you. <laughs>